Well, okay, we begin uh, a new series uh, on the subject of grace entitled Amazing Grace. And uh, this is the first uh, lesson, first sermon in this preaching series entitled What's So Good About the uh, Good News? Uh, there'll be six um, uh, lessons uh, in this particular uh, series. I encourage you to uh, follow uh, the series by uh, attending the um, evening service. That's when we'll be uh, preaching those. Now the hymn which uh, we sang before the lesson entitled Amazing Grace is one of the best known hymns sung by, you know, by believers and by unbelievers alike. And um, it describes the beauty of God's grace, which is the theme of this uh, preaching series. You know, it's interesting that it is this concept of grace in the Christian religion that captures the imagination of people when they think about Christianity. I think when they think about Christianity, really think about it deeply, they're not just thinking about buildings and so on and so forth. They're thinking about the heart and soul of this religion and the heart and soul of this religion is the concept of grace and that concept is so beautifully captured in this particular hymn. Now, not a lot of people realize that John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace, also wrote nine additional verses to the four that are usually printed in our songbooks. John Newton's life was an embodiment of this song. He writes with experience. When he was seven years old, he lost his mother, and then later he became a sailor and eventually worked on slave ships. In a cruel irony, he himself became a slave and was sold to a black woman who treated him like an animal as revenge for the people who were so badly treated among her own race. Now he was saved from this degrading life and became a minister and a writer of hymns that stirred the hearts of people the world over. And of course, the many hymns that he wrote, probably the most famous one is Amazing Grace. Shortly before his death in 1807, he wrote the following, and I quote, though I am not what I ought to be, nor what I think, or rather what I wish to be, nor what I hope to be, I can truly say that I am not what I once was, a slave to sin and Satan, and I can heartily join with the Apostle Paul and acknowledge by the grace of God, I am what I am. And so in our series, we're going to try to capture and describe this, this amazing grace that John Newton so powerfully felt and so eloquently wrote about. Now there are several ways of learning what the Bible says about a particular subject. One of the basic steps, however, is to begin with the original meaning of the word itself and then examine how Jesus and the apostles used that word. Now the meaning of the word grace is the following. The original Greek word, the New Testament was written in the, in the Greek, of course, so the original Greek word translated into the English word grace was charis. In early Greek literature, the word kara, from which charis is taken, meant beautiful or lovely or attractive, charming, that which is delightful. By New Testament times, the word had come to signify joy or rejoicing. In later Latin translations, the word also included the idea of gratitude. And like all words, you know, this word you know, evolved um, in meaning uh, with, uh, with time. So when all of the ideas are combined, our word grace refers to that which is lovely, happy, generous, you know, as, in, as in giving or receiving a gift. We know that grace is not itself a thing. You can't touch grace, it's not an object, you know, it's not a chair or a, something like that. You know, it's not a, a physical object. Uh, it's a word that describes the nature and the value of something else, usually someone else. In normal literature, it was used to describe a spirit of generosity and kindness and loveliness. In other words, we would say he is gracious. We understand what that means, you know, uh, someone who's merciful and kind. Or she is, she is graceful, something, uh, someone uh, female, lovely to look at and 
her movements and her attitude and so on and so forth are graceful. Now in biblical terms, the word was used to describe God's attitudes and God's actions towards mankind. What God has done for man, from the creation of the universe to the saving of his soul, all of this is referred to as grace, God's, uh, God's grace. Now the word is used in a variety of ways uh, in the New Testament, actually 170 times. Um, it's also fascinating to note that Paul the Apostle uses it 101 times. He, you know, he's the champion for the word grace in his writings. Uh, also interesting to note that uh, Jesus never used the word grace because the Bible refers to Him as the epitome of grace. Uh, John, in John chapter 1 verse 17 says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So because grace is at once a simple yet vast subject, there are a lot of misunderstandings about grace. Although the word grace can be used to describe you know, God's essential character, His kindness and generosity, or God's attitude in creating the world, He was joyful in doing so, or how we should treat one another with mercy and kindness, with grace. The most repeated and most important idea that this word describes, however, has to do with mankind's salvation from sin. So you understand what I'm saying here. Uh, the word grace is used in a lot of contexts, but the one context that it is used in the most is when, talking about, when the Bible is talking about man's salvation. The basic doctrine of the Bible is the doctrine of salvation. The entire Bible has been produced in order to explain this one basic idea. Now, in the process, God has also managed in the Bible to describe how the world and mankind were created, how sin came into the world, how He created a special nation of people called the Jews, and all other related information that tells the story of Jesus, the early church, and the eventual end of the world. We talk about that in the New Testament. However, all of this revelation and all of this information has been given in order to provide a kind of a backdrop, if you wish, and an explanation for the most important thing that God wanted to accomplish, and that was the saving of mankind from the destruction of sin. And so this salvation, this saving, was motivated, watch for it, by His grace. That's why the Bible calls it salvation by grace. Let's read a passage, shall we, if you have your Bibles. Chapter two in the book of Ephesians, uh, verses eight and nine. Here Paul says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one, no one may boast. So, Salvation by grace is the essential doctrine of the Bible. It's the key idea, it's the, it's the bottom line, if you wish. Salvation is what God did, and grace is why He did it and how He accomplished. This is why the study of grace is so important. It is the study of God's character and motivation in doing what He has done for us, especially in the area of salvation. So when we will be using the term grace in our series, we'll be referring to God's kindness and generosity and joyfulness, as well as His method of saving sinful man. Now, believe it or not, there are some people who think that grace, or too much grace, is dangerous. You know, we, we tend to kind of go from one side to the other here. Too much grace, not enough grace. Some people think too much grace is dangerous, and there are reasons for this. First of all, they don't understand the idea of grace in the first place. That's why they think that too much grace is dangerous. They think that grace is liberty. In other words, they think that grace is really the, the, the freedom to indulge in small vices. 
You know, they think that grace means the freedom to do what you want or that God excuses sin because of His goodness. You know, I can continue in this vice, I can continue in this weakness of character, I can continue in this secret sin because you know, I'm under grace. But we know as Christians that we have a duty to reject liberalism hiding as grace. But we mustn't reject legitimate grace. And so many people have a, this idea about grace, you know, that it's dangerous, it leads to you know, uh, sinfulness. They think that because they haven't been taught correctly about the subject of grace. And hopefully we'll kind of remedy that in this series. Others prefer a works system. That's why they reject the idea of grace. You know, human pride prefers the law where man can pay something or do something in order to achieve salvation. For example, you know, uh, uh, they're going to live the highest moral code that they can, which is fine, mind you. But they're thinking, you know, I'm living a high moral code, therefore I'm acceptable to God. Or they're going to follow strict ritual rules. We're going to do you know, Bible things and Bible ways and I'm just going to make sure that we do everything just so. And in this way, I'll be acceptable somehow to God. Or I will work, I will make personal sacrifice, I will do things you know, that demonstrate my holiness. And of course, these cost man something, right? High moral uh, lifestyle, sacrifice, and doing things, so on and so forth. That's a high cost. And it feels religious. But the truth of the matter is, we cannot exchange these things for forgiveness or for the perfection that is only available through Christ. Why? Why? Why can't we exchange these things? Well, very simply, because these things are themselves not perfect. It can never be, your moral code can never be high enough and you can't do enough works and you can't follow strictly enough in order to exchange that activity for salvation or for perfection. And so the grace system requires man to abandon these types of efforts at self-salvation. And that's very difficult because, as I've mentioned, we're proud as people. We want to chip in. We want to, you know, we want to do our part in all of this. And then another reason why people are afraid or you know, reject the idea of grace is that they fear living by faith. Let's read another passage, shall we? This time in Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 9. Paul says about himself that he wants to be found in him, meaning in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law. There's the high moral standard. There's the you know, righteousness derived from the law. There's the I do all the rituals correctly and so on and so forth. So he says, I, I, I want to be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, not something which I accomplished through strict law keeping, but that, and what does he talk about? But that, that meaning that righteousness, that acceptability before God. He says, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. So among other things, Paul is saying grace requires that we totally depend on God for righteousness. He'll give us the righteousness. We can't accomplish it. And Paul says, you know what? That's the righteousness that I want. And this offer, many times, sounds just too good to be true to people who are afraid of grace. Wow, I'm going to be, I'm going to be okay with God because I depend on Him and not because I, quote, do things. And so people are a little, a little suspicious of that and they kind of try to hedge their bets with another method. Yeah, yeah, this grace thing is good, but I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, chip in, so to speak. You know, when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to salvation, we have to accept the fact that it's grace or nothing. There's no other system. 
I want us to read another passage, this time in Galatians, uh, chapter one, verse six to eight. Paul again saying, I'm amazed, and he's talking to the Galatians here, this particular group of Christians. He says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. Now, we need to realize in this passage that the danger in this particular church that Paul is writing to was not that they were going in the direction of too much grace or cheap grace, but rather they were letting go of grace and they were trading it in for a more comfortable and predictable system of law. Where the law said, well, if you do this, you get that. And they felt more comfortable with that idea. And Paul is saying, whoever's preaching this to you, whoever's teaching this to you, even if it's an angel teaching this to you, that person should be accursed. Why? Because they're talking you out of your salvation. You're trading in salvation based on faith because of God's grace in order to go back to, I do this, I get that type of thing based on the law. So, in order to avoid these types of mistakes in our day, in our age, we need to go back to the apostles' teaching to the early church about this subject. And so I ask you to go to the book of Acts, shall we, and just read a very familiar passage with you, and we'll see what were the apostles teaching the early disciples. Acts chapter two, this time beginning in verse uh, 30, uh, 37. And this is where Peter is preaching the gospel to the people on the day of Pentecost. He's preached to them about the birth and the, of course the life, the ministry, uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, in verse, and, and of course he tells the people, you people are guilty of having crucified him. That, that sin is on you. You've rejected your Messiah. You've put him to death with your own hands. And so we pick up the verse in verse 37 and it says, now when they, the crowd meaning, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to Himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So then, those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So I read this familiar passage to ask this question. What exactly, you know, what doctrine exactly was Luke referring to that the apostles taught? We see them teaching the gospel and so on and so forth, and then it says that the new disciples were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. Well, what were they teaching? Well, what they were teaching was the, who was Christ and what were His teachings? Because the book of Acts and the epistles were not written when this particular event was taking place. So what were the apostles teaching these people in Jerusalem? Well, that Jesus was the Messiah and, 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 and how they were to be saved and so on and so forth. That's what they were teaching. And what exactly would they be saying to these people? Well, we read further on that they were teaching them about the person of Christ and His teaching. Obviously, the plan of salvation that God sent Jesus and their response to God's plan of salvation, which in their case they understood and had obeyed uh, repentance and baptism. The point I'm trying to make is that what the apostles taught was Jesus Christ and God's grace in saving us through Him. John chapter 3, verse 16, right? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever should believe in Him shall not perish but will have eternal life. That's what they were teaching, kind of the nuts and bolts 
of the salvation. They didn't have to teach these people about Jewish history. They, they were Jews, many of them. And many of them were in Jerusalem. They understood the religion of the Jews, the sacrificial system, so on and so forth. What the apostles were doing were, was putting all of those things that were written in the Old Testament into context and demonstrating how Jesus was the fulfillment of all these things and how God used Jesus in order to save them. So we make a fundamental mistake when we begin teaching someone the gospel and we begin by teaching them, and here's my point, we begin by teaching them you know, church history or organization. You know, someone wants to study the Bible, so we start teaching them about what is the church and you know, how the church is organized and the, the New Testament church is the church of the Bible, so on and so forth. Or we begin by teaching them the falseness of other religions. This religion is not true, that religion makes a mistake, and so on and so forth. Or we begin teaching them how to respond to the gospel. You know, we start teaching them that, well, they need to be baptized, they need to repent, they need to confess Christ, so on and so forth. When we do these type of things, rather than teaching them the good news of the gospel, which is the, which is the fact that we are saved by God's grace through faith. See what I'm saying? I'm not saying these other things are not important. I'm just saying we've got, we've got the thing backwards. You know, when, when, the, when the apostles were teaching the people at Pentecost, Notice, when Peter was preaching, he wasn't preaching uh, uh, you know, about Jewish history. He wasn't preaching about uh, uh, how the church would be organized. He was preaching the gospel, the good news. And so the first point I really want to make in our series about grace and salvation is this. We are saved through God's grace. In other words, because of His kindness and mercy and love and generosity. This is the motivation for salvation. This is what moved it. This is the why. So when we say we're saved by grace, that's what we're talking about. The reason that we have access to salvation is because God is gracious. All right, number two, we are saved through faith in Jesus Christ. This is the method as opposed to no salvation or salvation through law. Listen, God has got a choice to make here. Man has sinned, Adam has sinned, uh, you know, man's nature has fallen, he's condemned. So God has a choice of three things. One, well, no salvation. You know what, you messed it up, I told you what to do, I gave you everything, you just went and messed up, too bad, so sad. You know, you're on your own and eventually you know, the devolution of mankind and the earth, eventually everybody kills each other off, there's nothing left. That's one, you know, one way to go. Secondly, uh, well maybe then I can just make uh, uh, you know, robots. You know, I made a mistake with Adam, I gave him free will, I'll do something else. The, the, the people that come after him will have no free will, they'll have to obey. Is really, you know, that's the second choice. And then the third choice is to maintain free will, but offer salvation. And the method through which an individual is saved will be that they believe in God and trust in Him to give that to them, based on their faith in Jesus Christ. So we are saved through faith. That's the method that God chose. He could have said you're saved through law, or He could have said no salvation at all, but He said, you know what, you're going to be saved through a method of faith. All right, the third thing we can say, we are saved through baptism. Oh, wait a minute, is that a contradiction? In 1 Peter 3, verse 21, Peter says, now that baptism does save you. How does that, you know, how does that mesh with grace and faith? Well, baptism is the proper biblical demonstration of our faith. That's where that fits in as opposed to responding by intellectual assent. You know, just my brain wave decides, I do believe. Okay, that intellectual assent, that's the response or demonstration of faith that God wants. Or maybe we should cross ourselves. Maybe that's the demonstration of faith. Or maybe uh, we should just say these, the following words, I accept Jesus as my personal Savior. Maybe that's the response of faith. Or maybe we start speaking in tongues or do miracles. You know, 
there's a response of faith. But the Bible says that God gave baptism, immersion in water. This is the response of faith. This is the expression of faith that God has given to man in order to demonstrate his belief in Jesus Christ. So when it, come, when it came to the apostles' teaching concerning salvation, this is what they taught the early disciples. You know, Jesus taught that a person was saved in all the following context. A person is saved through grace. Well, of course, without God's merciful you know, intervention there, there'd be no salvation. And so grace is the motivation, and we can say we're saved through grace. Uh, uh, we are saved through faith. Well, yes, we are saved through faith. That's the method, that's the system that God uses. As opposed to a system of law, He uses a system of faith to save us. And we're saved through baptism. Yes, that's equally true. Baptism is the biblical response of faith that we make to the offer of salvation. All right, let's talk about this idea that grace is free. People are always saying grace is free, but they put qualifiers. In Romans 6.23, Paul says, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So Paul is talking about salvation being free, that God's grace towards us is free. What does that mean that grace is free? Well, let's go to another passage in Romans, this time Romans chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, and let's read the following. Again, Paul, he says, Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. So what does Paul say about the one who works? And what does he say about the one who believes? You know the difference. The one who works is the one who is trying to be saved through work, through the law, through rule keeping, perfectionism, so on and so forth, as opposed to one who is saved through a system of faith, a system of belief. Okay, what does he, what does he say? Well, he says the one who works gets what he earns, and the one who believes receives a gift. That's the difference. Now, in the book of Romans, Paul uses the term grace to encompass not only God's love and mercy, but also the end result of that mercy, and that is our salvation. So when he says grace is free, in a sense he's saying God's love and kindness towards us is free. It's a gift. There's nothing we do to earn that. He's also saying that the final result of that love and mercy, which is our salvation, this also is free. It is also a gift. You know, there's never a problem with God's attitude or God's gift. The problem always is with man and his understanding and his attitude. Now, one idea that causes a problem with many is the idea of God's grace, you know, the idea that God's grace is free. And here's why they have a problem with this. First of all, they think that free grace implies that man is totally helpless. Well, that's true, he is. If grace, which is God's kindness and man's ultimate salvation, if, if grace is free, it means that man can do nothing to earn it, even if he wanted to. Secondly, free grace eliminates this kind of bootstrap religion. You, know, you pick yourself up and you lift yourself up. You know. It, it, free grace eliminates Christianity as a self-improvement course. You know, all you have to do is believe in yourself, just do it, and so on and so forth. And it also takes away, this free grace idea, also takes away this, this self-reliance that somehow you can you know, boot camp train yourself spiritually to, to get where you want to go. We don't know what it means to be totally, totally dependent on God, and we usually don't want to learn. And yet the idea of grace necessitates us to realize that we are totally dependent on God for everything, including salvation. Another fear, if you wish, um, is that free grace, uh, or another fear of the idea of free grace, 
uh, because they think that it eliminates human responsibility. Yeah, yeah, grace is free, but we got to do something. You know, in my experience, uh, I've found that you, you can preach all you want about the five steps of salvation, you know, hear, believe, confess, repent, be baptized. You can preach that all day long and all the things you have to do in order to be saved without uh, ever mentioning the word grace and nobody will say a thing, but don't preach free grace without mentioning human responsibility and obedience or else you'll be labeled a liberal or a heretic. Brothers and sisters, are we more concerned about what a person knows concerning baptism or concerning grace? I know they need to know both, of course, but I'm putting forward the idea that there will be no baptism, no meaningful one anyways, if they don't know about grace first. Preaching grace does not eliminate baptism, but we need to remember the role of each. Preaching the grace of God is the message of the gospel. It is what is good about the good news. I mean, the fact that you're immersed in the water, that's not good news. The fact that you're going to be coming to church to listen to a lot of sermons, that, that's not good news. The fact that you're going to have to deny yourself your, 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 your sinful urges, that's not good news. The fact that you're going to have to kind of turn the other cheek, that's not good news. Where's the good news there? That's not good news. But the fact that you, the sinner, who has done things that you will never be able to go back and fix, the fact that you, the sinner, cannot do enough to please God, the fact that you will receive your salvation because you trust God to give it to you, that's great news, great news. And so preaching baptism you know, becomes necessary when the hearer has understood and believed the good news. I mean, you know, once you understand the good news of grace, the next, where's the water? That's the normal thing. What must I do? Charles Hodge, Christian preacher and writer, says the following, tell men what God did before you tell man what they should do. So the beauty and power of the gospel is that despite our sins, God chose to be kind and merciful towards us, there's grace, and He arranged for us to be forgiven and receive eternal life through no merit or effort on our own. Man, that's, that's great news. Now again, and I know some of you are thinking this, where does human responsibility fit in? Don't we have a part to play in this? You know, if grace is free, you know, God's kindness and salvation, then where does repentance and baptism and faithful until death, where does that fit in? Because that's also in the Bible, is it not? If grace is free, well then everyone in the world receives it and is saved, aren't they, if it's free? If grace is free, then why do I have this daily struggle as a Christian? Well, it's not that grace demands or requires. This is the way the law speaks. The law demands, the law requires, obedience, perfect performance, so on and so forth. That's the language of the law. Grace does not demand, grace produces. That's the difference. Grace gives, grace motivates, grace provokes. That's what grace does. The law demands perfect obedience and it produces death because it shows you that you are imperfect, that you are incapable of being perfect, and that the consequences of being imperfect is death. Romans chapter three. So you know what I'm saying? That's what the law does. That's exactly why the law was designed. Grace, on the other hand, demands nothing. It requires nothing. It reveals God's awesome love in the cross of Jesus and in doing so, watch for it, it produces faith. It produces repentance. It produces obedience. It produces joy and peace and so on and so forth. In Romans chapter 2, 
verse 4. Listen to what Paul says. He says, or do you think lightly of the riches of His kindness and tolerance and patience? Uh, three words that simply mean grace. Not knowing that the kindness of God, the grace of God, watch, he says, leads you to repentance. What is that? Notice it said leads you, not demands. That's what grace does. It provokes, it leads, it produces. And then if we were to go to the next book in the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 10, just verse 10, Paul says the following, he says, but by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. What was working inside Paul? What's he saying? He said, the grace of God inside of me is what produced this yearning to go into all the world, produced this desire for righteousness, produced this desire to do away with sin, and so on and so forth. It produced these things. So grace does not demand or require, it produces, it creates in man all the things that lead to salvation. The things we actually do, from our initial confessing of Christ to repentance and baptism to everyday struggle with sin to live as a Christian life, is not a list of rules or works done in exchange for salvation, that's the law. We do these things as a result of grace working in our hearts and minds. In other words, the law represents I have to. Grace, on the other hand, says I want to. I want to please God. I want to do what is right. I want to do away with sin. Sin in my life makes me sorrowful. I hate the sin in my flesh. I want to get rid of it. Well, who produces that desire in you? Not the devil, not yourself, not the law. Grace is what produces that in a person's soul. And so God's grace turns us from half to people to want to people, I want to repent, I want to be baptized, I want to serve, I want to give, I want to do what's right, I want to remain faithful. Grace produces that kind of people. I become this kind of person because of grace. The law does not have this power, only grace which has this power, and grace is free. And so, what's so good about the good news? Well, because of His grace, God offers salvation and eternal life to everyone based on faith, not law, or knowledge, or culture. I'll say it another, I'll say it another way. What's so good about the good news? God's grace makes it possible for all persons to go to heaven because they believe and not because they're perfect. As John Newton wrote long ago, through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. And so, as we close this first lesson in the series, I, I invite you to come and, and hear the remaining sermons on this topic in the weeks to come uh, on Sunday evenings. And the next lesson, uh, in the Amazing Grace series will be entitled The True Plan of Salvation. But as we close out, I invite any here who have been moved by God's amazing grace to repent of their sins, to confess Christ, to be baptized today without hesitation. And I also call on those Christians who need to be restored because of their unfaithfulness, or their pride, to come back to the comfort and the protection of God's grace. And as I close out, I leave you with the 13th and final verse that Newton wrote for this great hymn, which is actually not in our songbooks. He writes, the earth shall soon dissolve like snow, the sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below shall be forever mine. 
So if God is calling you here below, as John Newton writes, please come now as we stand and as we sit.